Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the session. We are having a little bit of technical difficulties. So if you could give us one more minute, we are going to figure this out. I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. Maybe you could type in the chat if you're able to hear me. Awesome. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Gordon. You can see me too? Wonderful, wonderful. Hi, Krista. Hi, everyone. Glad to have you in the session. We are setting up some options to present right now. I'm going to put myself on mute for just a moment, um, and we'll be right back. Everyone, we are going to try an alternative version. If you could continue to use the chat box to tell me if you can see Bill next and his presentation. Can you see Bill? I'm toggling between him and I. Can you see Bill and his presentation right now? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to toggle back to hop in. Not yet. No. Okay. How about now, Gordon? He's waving. Oh, good. Wonderful, Bill. Okay, Bill. <laughs> can you go so ahead? What do they see as far as PowerPoint slides? Can they hear my audio, too? Yeah. So can you hear Bill's audio? Yes. Okay. Testing A, B, C. Yes. Gordon has confirmed. Okay. There's a slight feedback to me, but I'll get used to that. Um, but I can change my slides with just the keystrokes here. Yep. You can start your presentation if you want to put it in, a, in the large presentation mode. Your choice. Did you... Just see me change slides? No, we see the uh, presentation. Yes, okay. we see your mouse hovering over the second slide right now. Okay. Um, 
Do you want to put? If that's working, you don't. That works. We can see it. Hey, I'm not going to play around with things. If, <laughs> if things are working, let, let's just go with it. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Take it I'm away, talk Bill. About how much I love this technology. Um, well, I, I don't really love this technology. Um, so, how many people do we have in the room? Do we know? 16 people. Looks like we've okay. got Julie, Priscilla. His screen is very tiny, Julie. I'm so sorry. It's it's what we're going to have to go with. He doesn't have presenter options in Hopin, so we're using the Google Meeting. Um, Priscilla, Julie, Dana, Philip, Gordon, Krista, Talmadge, And Bill, and I'm Jennifer Schrader Tyson. I'm currently chairing the Epi Lab Statistics section uh, during the time of COVID. It's been quite adventurous and so excited to bring Bill back to talk to us a little bit more. So I'm going to pass it to you, Bill. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you for inviting me today. And uh, if the slides ever malfunction, please let me know. And then I'm not going to be able to see your chats either. So if you have questions, I think we're going to just have to save it till the end. I can, Jennifer might be able to jump in. Yeah, I can toggle between the two screens. Okay, fantastic, Jennifer. If you'll be my moderator, and if I need to stop and answer a question, I'm fine with that. I'd, I, I'd rather do it in the middle of the presentation because I'm going to jump all over the place. Okay. Sounds great. Um, so my introduction, um, in 1982, I got a BSMT in medical technology, which is a laboratory degree. And then I spent 23 years at the uh, Newburn Hospital working the laboratory as microbiology supervisor. In 2000, I got a master's in public health at UNC Chapel Hill. And then in 2001, the 9-11 event, somebody started mailing anthrax letters. So the state had this desire to hire public health epidemiologists in the largest hospitals across North Carolina. So, so for 16 years, I've had the greatest job ever. And then 2020, uh, COVID hit. So I'm changing slides. So my disclosures are, you know, as far as financially, I work as a public health epidemiologist. So COVID means a lot to me. Um, as far as other things, I have no financial relationships to close, disclose. I do want to confess, um, I do want this pandemic to be as <laughs> over as fast as possible. And then I also have a very strong bias towards presenting only positive information. So um, I, I, it's hard for me to put negative stuff on the screen. So our objectives today, um, we're going to review what the, um, hospital infectious disease preparations were pre-COVID, um, the COVID timeline, COVID communications, um, talking about our hospital partners and our public health partners. Uh, we've all been stressed. So I want to do like a group therapy session so we can all talk together. The storytelling, you know, as far as epidemiology, storytelling is important. And our uh, COVID coping skills. So every year I uh, Compose like a 45 minute talk to talk at my local health department. I enjoy getting out of the office for a day and meeting all the faces that match the voices that I typically am talking to over the telephone. Um, so each year I spend the year collecting four or five, a collection of four or five stories out of the thousands of hospital cases that are entertaining. Normally I try to use a little bit of sense humor in my presentations. Um, but today's 
this lecture is being recorded and my boss may be listening. So any hint of humor is purely unintentional. Um, as an epidemiologist, we're expected to be medical historians. So there's a huge responsibility there to present the data and the timeline in a way that's easily understood in an unbiased way. Um, we're still in the middle of this COVID story. So don't expect me to be writing an end or make any predictions. And here, here's my uh, problem with today. I want to promote the Zoom and the WebEx programs. You know, we have to get comfortable with these programs. We have to embrace this technology. It helps us communicate with one another. Um, and, you know, we're also able to meet today. So this allows us, I do have to say that it's extremely awkward, um, but I'd rather be working out these problems with a group of my friends than having my boss depending on me to operate this technology. I really appreciate this. And I think y'all can realize the awkwardness of this and uh, please give us a little tolerance leeway, um, but thank you. And thank you, Jennifer, for working this out today. Oh, okay, so I got to get used to changing the slides too. Well, just to warn okay. you, warn you, Bill, it's it is hard for them to see the slides, and I'm trying to figure it out. Maximize. So you keep you keep going. I've heard if they double click on their screen, they can make the slides bigger. Okay. Oh, Gordon says better. Double clicking is not working today. Gotcha. Thanks, Priscilla. I appreciate the participation in this group. <laughs> um, do they still see my slides? No, we see the Vident Health background. Oh. It looked like you clicked and dragged the power. Yeah. Point. Yeah, I, I cannot get it in presentation mode. If you go presentation mode goes to a different goes to a different monitor for me, oh. and it won't slide over there. Gotcha. What if you went to view at the top and made yeah. the slide larger within this? context oh put it in reading view askia is suggesting um that's right next to the powerpoint icon at the bottom we see your desktop did that switch to a different monitor? Yeah, it's... Okay, yes, thank you. Move, remove the chat box. Okay. Let's figure out how to do that. All right. Go back to see my slides. We can, yes. It's small. Just gonna check the chat. I think people are fine with it. Shall we keep keep going? Yeah, I'm fine. I I don't know that I have a lot of small detail to read. Um, so I think even if sometimes the dates, the bar charts, will get small. Um, but can they see my cursor? Yes, we. You can I, see my cursor moving? Yes. Okay. So um, I'll just do a lot of talking for the things you can't read. I think okay. I made it a little bigger. Keep going, Bill. Okay, so the group therapy. Uh, this is tough times for everybody. 
adjusting to COVID is tough. We all have jobs to do. Um, but um, my advice during this is to, um, you know, treat everybody kind kindly. Um, with my job, um, I gravitated to the things that I was doing best, and the best things that I do are the bean county and being the official bean counter for the hospital, uh, reporting the COVID cases on the COVID deaths and being in good contact with the local health department. Um, I do think that you have to have a thick skin in this job um, during COVID and um, be ready to say that you're, you're wrong on occasion, acknowledge that, quickly acknowledge that and um, get on to reporting the truth. But, um, you know, things are going to happen during COVID and uh, we just have to be kind to one another. Okay, I want to talk about my, my favorite person in history he is Louis Pasteur. He's the uh, grandfather of microbiology and it's a microbiologist. Uh, I think he's one of the smartest scientists ever, but what he said initially, he, one of his quotes is, good favors, good fortune prepares, good fortune, I'll get it right here. Good fortune favors the prepared mind. And that's something I, I like to stick with. Um, but talking about what the state of hospital preparedness was um, four years ago, we've been preparing for an Ebola patient to walk in our emergency department at any time unannounced. So we stockpiled rooms full of PPE, getting ready for this patient to walk in, this one patient to walk in. Um, in 2014, the uh, Ebola outbreak in West Africa was scary. But I think, you know, we really squelched that outbreak with old fashioned infection control. And we stopped that outbreak with contact tracing and quarantining the sick. So in 2019, we had another Ebola outbreak in war torn Congo. In this situation, I think the Ebola vaccine stopped this one. The one thing that um, Ebola did do for hospitals is that we got very good at asking for travel information. Like, have you traveled outside the United States in the past three weeks? So since there are during the Ebola outbreaks in the last five years, we've had chikungunya and Zika virus. Uh, these two viruses dried up and went away. I suspect, you know, we hit the threshold for herd immunity in the target population that was most at risk for spreading these mosquito-borne illnesses, and they went away. So we have our yearly flu outbreaks, and it's good training for COVID. Um, flu is nice enough that it goes away after two or three months. Um, have we done the counting for COVID? I think we're at seven months of COVID at this point. Um, but flu is very nice that it goes away. Uh, COVID has been here for a solid seven months. So I want to touch back on my medical laboratory training. When I first started in the laboratory in the 1980s, um, I was talking to my coworkers and half of them had hepatitis B from um, handling blood samples in the laboratory, just, just the routine work. Half of them had hepatitis B. So the cleaner techniques help. But the real solution for curing hepatitis B in lab workers was vaccinating healthcare workers starting back in the 1980s. Uh, I do want to talk about con infection control and controlling things. Is this the trident here, the controlling the source, the route, the route of transmission? and the host, if you can break the chain anywhere there, 
uh, you can stop these outbreaks. So let's start with the COVID timeline. I think we all know this is just an easy review for people. Um, but the first time I heard about the COVID, it was um, it was New Year's Eve. And the uh, report that came from the World Health Organization was in Wuhan, China in December. There was this wet market where, where they had a lot of live animals. There were 41 cases that knew about um, terrible pneumonia. No person to person spread. That was important. Um, so, you know, we're thinking that, um, you know, this is just going to be isolated situation with uh, no person to person transmission. Um, it, it should just go away. There was this controversy that um, the virus may have started with. Um, there is a virology lab in Wuhan, and that the scientists were collecting respiratory swabs from wild animals and cultivating these specimens within that science laboratory, this virology laboratory in Wuhan, and that may have escaped. Um, you know, I, I do think the Chinese are doing this. I've also seen Americans say that they were collecting viral swabs from bats in caves. Um, so this is very dangerous work. It's it's a possibility that this virus may have escaped doing through this scientific work. Okay, I'm still on the COVID timeline. I have to admit that I was a very firm believer that COVID was going to go with warmer weather. I, I think a lot of people were in that camp. Um, maybe I was just overly hopeful. Maybe it goes back to my only one to report positive information, but yeah, I really thought it was going to go out with the warmer weather. And then when we look back at the SARS-1 virus, I've got that epi curve up and it starts in January 2003 and then it's over by June 2003. So it's my thought would we'd have the same thing. But I've already told you, you got to get used to eating crow in this job. So I was wrong. I'm sorry. Okay, so my first hospital patients on Black Friday, on March, Friday the 13th, we had this young adult come into the emergency department with a cough and fever. They had traveled to Florida. Uh, we notified the health department. We discharged him home. A specimen was collected, and I got to wait 10 days for a result to come back. So um, that, I call that limbo hell. So uh, that, that, that's awful. Um, a lot of people, a lot of anxious people wanting results as far as possible. So on this slide, I've got, I've got this fact sheet that I'm, um, you know, I want to save truth. So I keep using the same facts cover sheet and I just mark out the days. So you can see that, and this is just going to one health department. I've got 29 health departments that I routinely communicate with. So you can see all the urgency of this. And then it's going to the fax machine. And these fax machines at local county health departments are being overworked. We're expecting a lot from this one fax line to get all these lab results coming back, getting my positive CD reports, communicable disease reports, and they're all going through this one funnel. But there was this thought early on that we could contain the, con the COVID virus with um, good contact tracing, that early on, if we got to these cases early on, we could squash the COVID virus in our communities. The, the results are slow coming back. And um, we're waiting 10 days to two weeks to get results coming back. So drum roll, here's my uh, first group of heroes, the laboratory COVID heroes. 
So in mid-March, I had a much, must have had like 10 patients hospitalized as PUIs, and PUI stands for patient under investigation. They're very sick. They're eager to be tested. And, um, you know, my bosses, the doctors, the hospital leadership, they were eager for information too. Um, so I really have to talk about my laboratory heroes. Just last year, my hospital hired a new laboratory lead pathologist. He was nearing retirement age. He'd had a full career in New York City hospitals. He was trained at Harvard School of Medicine. He was knowledgeable in the newest PCR technologies and eager to go whole hog into COVID testing. He had team support, the frontline laboratorians, and had the green light from hospital leadership to buy the hospital equipment that he needed. And very soon on, Vidant Health would have five different platforms to run COVID testing. Wow. Um, I've heard my fellow hospitals, some of them are having to use, still use reference labs. And the reference labs, they kind of waffle back and forth. Initially, they were two weeks getting results back. One day, they were reporting three days to get results back. Um, but typically, Vidant Medical Center has been getting things done overnight. So I've had these very sick patients. And then on March the 21st, it was Saturday afternoon, I remember, because I was taking a nap. And uh, the phone rang. And um, they told me, well, the first patient we ever tested for COVID here in our lab tested positive. Um, so, wow. You know, and then over that night, the next five out of six patients to be tested came back positive. So they had prioritized, the, like I say, we had a lot of people in our hospital that were eager to be tested that we pretty much highly suspected of COVID. But when we got these positive lab results, it made all the difference. And, you know, we also could get the negatives too. So due to my laboratory local heroes with this overnight testing, um, it really got me out of that limbo hell of reporting everybody, reporting all the PUIs, and we could only report the positive results at that time as far as the, doing the CD reporting, which, communicable disease reporting, which was very labor intensive. There was a state law, and it's needed that um to get the total number of tested, then you need the total number to get your positivity right. So that's the importance of having the number of negative tests too. So my laboratory heroes saved me with that too, that they reported all the positives and the negatives to North Carolina DHHS electronically. Thank you, laboratory. Okay, my other heroes, um, the IS people, the information system people. Here at Vidant Medical Center, we have an incredible IS team support. And they're my second group of heroes that I wanna talk about. Over the past years that I've been working as an epidemiologist, as a, as a laboratorian, the patient's chart has just really exploded in incredible information. When I was first a laboratorian, we would actually glue, go to the patient's chart and um, hand glue in the laboratory results that the um, instrument would print out. So you can see how slow this would be. So now with the current technology, you can see I can sit at my kitchen table and view the patient's chart. And, um, or anywhere I can find a, a secure Wi-Fi connection. So in April and March, March and April, um, all the all the record keeping 
was being done by Excel files and sending email. Our method of keeping our hospital nurses and administrators up to date was a morning and afternoon email report every day, including weekends. So that was quite a burden. <laughs> I'm glad it's over. Um, but this internal email also included confidential information, patient names, which was a huge security risk that I'm sending this email out to 60 of my trusted hospital partners. Um, but it is patient information, it's patient names being sent by email, which is a security risk. So here's what the um, IS team did for me. They developed this radar dashboard that um, was available in real time. It was being updated. You could click on each hospital and you could get the patient's room numbers, their medical record numbers, their names, their ages, whether they're on a ventilator. It was incredible and it saved me a lot of energy. So the next innovation they had um, was this Tableau dashboard. And I, Tableau is a vendor, a computer vendor that um, does all this fantastic work. But with the Tableau, I could get the census on the top. And here I know that I've got, my numbers are small too, 69, 69 patients in the hospital on May the 11th with COVID. The black line, I had 21 patients in the ICU and I had eight on ventilators. And this bottom chart here shows me the number of daily admissions. So I'd, I had a small peak in the middle of May and then it was going down towards June. So don't, don't get caught up in that, things will change. I do have to talk about one of my really favorite sources of information early on was the News and Observer newspaper that you go on their website and you could get their Excel file. Uh, I thought this was incredible. I was curious about the historical information for each county. You know, I needed to see the epi curve for like Duplin County is one. Duplin County went sour early on in like May and June. And here's their neighboring counties, Sampson County. Here's Northampton. Northampton had nursing home outbreaks. And the scale is different on this. The numbers are so small, I, I'm certain you can't see it. But this is 20 for Northampton, where this for Duplin is getting up to 50 or 60. Here's Pitt County over here. Their, their high points are hitting 10 and 9. So Pitt County had much lesser, even though it was steady numbers, they didn't have the nursing home outbreaks going on at that time. Um, but I was getting all this information from the News and Observer, so I really appreciate it. So with this news and observer information, you're able to get their Excel file. So I had a hospital administrator ask me about the case fatality rate for Northeast North Carolina. So I do have to talk about the limitations for case fatality rate. Um, you know, it depends on the numerators and the denominators. So I did do this case fatality rate I, out of the News and Observer, I got the number of cases and the number of deaths for each county in my area. And I did the total at the bottom. It's just simple math, came out to a nice round number, 2%. That was fantastic. Um, I do want to talk about the limitations though. The county that's worse on here really is a small county with limited resources they probably did not do a lot of testing, but they also had a terrible outbreak in one of their nursing homes. So I really think, you know, they were counting their numerators, the top number, really good. 
So they got great top numbers. And then with their denominators, their test numbers, their cases, um, they had limited resources. So their denominator was probably small. So you have to take case fatality rate with a grain of salt. So while we're still talking about case fatality rate, the um, entire world just hit 1 million deaths, 1 million COVID deaths. So that case fatality rate is a nice even 3%. When you look at the United States, it's 2.8%. There was a lot of talk early on, like, can you predict what the case fatality rate in the middle of an epidemic? You know, you still had people sick, but we've been in it for seven months now. So are we more able to get a good case fatality rate? I know early on we were predicting what the case fatality rate was going to be. And we were saying it was going to be between two and 5%. So I think our, our leaders at that our scientists were pretty much right on target. Um, with this chart, I want to show you that I've got the case fatality rate. So these high numbers here are almost 8%. And the states there are Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, New Hampshire. Um, these states had really high case fatality rates. Here's North Carolina at 1.7. So this group of states here were those states that were hit early on in the epidemic. Um, and you can see that they had a lot of deaths early on. So I wanna switch over and talk about uh, my source of truth. When I wanna hear about what's going on with medicine, I really enjoy this med cram, you can find it on YouTube, and he's giving an update, one or two updates every week, and it's free. It's incredible information. It's unbiased. It's um very scientifically based, and uh, you know he'll admit when he's wrong. He'll admit when it's a prediction is not grounded in science yet, uh, but he's fantastic. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um some of the the medical therapies that are saving lives now that, that our doctors have learned is proning, which is when you put the patient on their stomach and it creates more internal lung space. It's called proning, remdesivir, which is an antiviral. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, steroids, <clears throat> trying to keep your antibody, your own immune system in check, not getting overwhelmed, not getting this cascade of antibodies inflaming your body, keeping patients off ventilators, convalescent plasma, giving you, giving you the sick people, other people's antibodies. Vitamin D uh, is something you can do at home reducing stress and quality sleep. Uh, those bottom two are something we all can do. Uh, I'm trying to get quality sleep. <laughs> I have been taking vitamin D since the very start of this outbreak. So I do, I, I am a big believer in vitamin D. So you have to forgive me. My slides are not in chronological order, uh, but I do want to show that we were very happy. This one was one of the happy days in the hospital when we saw that the state came out with their new Tableau dashboard. They had a lot of stuff, a lot of data, a lot of epidemiological data posted on their website. But then when this Tableau came out, it was incredible. Um, but we could get the real time information and at our fingertips, we had the number of cases over time, cases by county, uh, hospital admits, and uh, nursing home outbreak information. So this is just an example of 
what we can get from the state website that first started May 20. So here's the number of cases, the epi curve for Pitt County. And what I want to demonstrate here is that um, this peak here is when ECU, East Carolina University, reopened. They made a lot of good changes as far as they, they quit face-to-face -face classes for college students. And our, our curve went back to where it was. So I really have to applaud the ECU people. You know, they're, they're still educating college students, um, but we don't have this huge outbreak going on anymore. And here's another example of the information that we're getting. Um, it shows the number of deaths in Pitt County over time. So you can do this for all the 100 counties. So here's the current state of my hospital dashboard. I can see that I've got over the whole COVID epidemic in my hospital systems, we've had over 2,000 people admitted. And currently, I've got 120 across the system hospitalized that are COVID patients. Some of these are COVID recovered patients. Well, they're kind of like the long haulers. They've they're past their acute stage, their contagious stage, but they still got long-term illnesses, heart, liver, lung, brain, coagu um, coagulopathy problems, blood clots, um, that they still need hospital care. The good thing is I can see it a declining number of admits recently. So I've got that 120 currently hospitalized. I've got the 31 in ICU and I got 17 on ventilator. <clears throat> Had a health director call me and he wanted very specific information about his county. And initially, all I could do was just send him a screenshot of the whole system. But with technology, the improvements that they've made with IS, I can sort this by county of residence now. So I can sort this by his county, and I can see his patients in multiple different Biden hospitals. I get the deaths over time and I get how many of his patients are hospitalized. So it looks like it's seven. Yes, it's a midnight. They're currently hospitalized. There it is right there, seven. Also got the laboratory dashboard. And then it's, I'm sure it's small for you, but yesterday was, I had over a hundred positives. Had over 100 positives. I can see where they're coming from as far as the, um, a lot of them are coming from hospital testing. Some of them are coming from Pitt County Health Department, um, our outpatient doctor clinics. <clears throat> I've got a positivity rate of 7.4% over the last seven days so that's an average um but that is a high number when i was talking to my hospital co-workers my statewide co public health epidemiologists they had numbers that were less than five four percent positive so our area is getting hit harder by covid right now than the rest of the state and if you go to the state maps you'll see that we have the 
the highest counties in, in, in this cluster that we had in, in northeastern North Carolina. We'd gone for a long time with very few cases, you know, the, the Raleigh's, the Charlotte's, they were getting hit hard and we had very few cases. So I really think that by going so long without cases, that made us very susceptible to what's going on now, that it, it, it's our turn to have a high number of cases, that we had a lot of targets for this virus and it's hitting us now. So with this incredible laboratory information, we have fantastic ways of drilling down on the data. This slide I'm showing the Hispanic, the Latinx numbers. So here I've got the numbers of Hispanics tested. And here's this monthly number, July is over a thousand, thousand five hundred. And then it levels off October and September. The number of positives, the same thing to positivity rate. So this could be, we did a lot of community testing and that community testing is included in my Vidant health system numbers. This chart here is my hospital admissions for Hispanics. So you can see it's the same pattern that I have a lot of Hispanics, Hispanic, Latina X, admitted the month of July and then it levels off for August and September. The COVID deaths for Hispanics are just 14. So this number is small and you really can't make any judgment about that small number that at 14 deaths. This admissions, you know, those are big numbers. It does seem strange because if I was doing more outpatient testing, that wouldn't reflect hospital admissions. Hospital admissions should be independent of the variety of the population of people that I'm testing as outpatients. I shared this with my other PHEs across the state and they weren't seeing it. Um, Chapel Hill's UNC Chapel Hill was saying, currently 40% of their hospital admissions were Hispanic. So this is a mystery to me, um, but it just gives you an example of what we can do with these good tools that we've gotten from IS. I wanna find out more about this and I'd like to see if the state can cut their data by week, by month, and look at Hispanic popular. Okay, moving on, I wanna talk about one of my favorite sites early on, Worldometer. They were in the game early. They set the stage for um, quality data. Um, in this chart, you can see of all the COVID cases in the world, the United States has 21% and we're leading the world. India is, is catching up with us. If we slow down some, India may, be, may replace the United States as number one. Like I say, I like to report positive information. I'd love for the United States to become number two. Here's one of my other favorite, John Hopkins site. This is all 50 United States. And it's their own little epi curve for each state. Here's North Carolina. But what John Hopkins does, they look at the last two weeks and they paint the state red or blue, depending on whether we're going up or down with COVID. So I've got these darker blues for Iowa. Um, and then I've got Kansas in red, Rhode Island in red. 
Um, so they're the ones that are trending up. The blues are trending down. Like I say, it's only looking at the last two weeks, and sometimes mathematically, just looking at that last two weeks, it's almost like a seesaw that depending on what you had early in your two week period compared to what you had late in your two week period, can you can tip your te- seesaw either way. So you gotta be careful looking at this. Also, the weekend, Tuesday is usually the worst time to look at this chart that everything has gone blue. And if you're looking for a higher intensity of red, Saturday and Sunday are the better times to look at this. So it has a bias depending on what day of the week you look at it. And it's really based on that two week thing, that two week direction of the curve. Okay, my other heroes are hospital heroes. When the um, COVID started right at the very beginning of the outbreak, my hospital leadership shifted all hands on board to managing COVID-19. And here's one of my other lucky things that um, my Vinant Health CEO is a physician, clinical care pulmonologist, and he also has a master's degree in epidemiology. Uh, that is like a wow thing um, that my boss's 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 boss has a master's in epidemiology. And he's been leading the entire operation. That is fantastic that I, you know, I've been able to do the reporting, manage the numbers, follow the numbers, and have had other hospital leaders step up on visitation, curtailing certain services, on PPE, all the other supplies, writing policy, um, increasing the testing outreach and signage such as we use it um, in the hospital lobbies. The flu season is coming. Um, And we're curious what impact flu is going to have on COVID. My hope is we're going to have a a mild flu season. When we um, started social distancing, our flu numbers just dropped off. That was, we were still having a lot of flu last March. We started those social distancing, and that was really the end of flu. Here in this picture, you can see uh, my coworker getting their flu shot, their mandatory flu shot. Here, this is a chart showing the weekly number of viral isolate, and this chart has has the flu numbers, it has adenovirus, it has RSV. The RSV are these reds back here in the spring. So early on, this starts at April 2020. Here's the last two weeks for me. And the yellow is rhinovirus, enterovirus. It doesn't separate those two, but you can see it Rhinovirus is in high numbers for the last two weeks. Part of the the main reason for that is we've started doing more respiratory viral panels that will we get the emergency department patients coming in. We're not just testing them for COVID anymore. We're going to test them for at least four things: flu, RSV, COVID and flu A, B. So those are the four. So that's increased testing volume is why you see those last two weeks going up. So I'm starting to wrap up here. Um, last Friday, this is all my news. On uh, North Carolina bars were reopening. They've been closed for since the beginning of COVID. And they were opening for outdoor space only. But this is Greenville, North Carolina, last Friday at 5.01, people waiting to get in the bar. Unmasked people standing side by side, 
waiting to get in the bar. Okay, I'm still wrapping up. I like it to talk about the things we know and the things we don't know. I get a lot of requests to make predictions and things like that. My favorite answer to all those is we don't know. And so in wrapping up, the winter viral season is coming. When will we have a safe, effective COVID vaccine? It's scary that the uh, COVID numbers in Europe are going back up again. That Italy, Spain, United Kingdom are seeing high numbers again. New York, uh, which had it, is only just recently started opening back up. It's starting to see a slight increase. Nowhere near what they had before, but their numbers are going up for the first time in three or four months. So what we do know, um, slowing the virus gives our hospital space to operate so safely, that we're not overwhelmed. So slowing the virus isn't important. Slowing the virus gives our physicians more time to develop life-saving therapies. And slowing the virus gives us a better chance to be vaccinated. So that's all I have. Um, I'm available for questions and comments. I think we have extra time. Yeah. Jennifer, are you still on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Do you wanna stop sharing your screen on the Google Meet so they can see your face larger? I will. Awesome. And then I am going to fix what I've done. Oh, here we go. Hold on one second, Bill. They can't see you yet. Sorry. <laughs> um, there you are. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. What questions do you have? I'm not sure if people can share their microphones or if we do have to type in the chat um you did have one comment uh, a, a few seconds ago about i think this was related to the data that you were sharing as a resource um they said that has been very helpful and appreciated any other comments? Yeah, on the data, I just want to say that the most important data to me is my local information. And I think, you know, at the local health departments, your health directors are going to come to you and they're going to want your local data. Now, that's going to be the most important thing. Um, if you don't have your local data, state data is good, regional data is good, or what's happening in your neighboring county is second best but um it's still good but everybody there is a longing for everybody to have their own numbers and and i do want to i didn't mention it but um you know as far as the storytelling of covid we hadn't written the end of this story yet um but i, I do encourage you all to start writing your own covid stories that this is something you're going to be asked about in the future and if you go ahead and have your story on paper at this point, uh, it'll be, you'll be much more inclined to tell an incredible story. Um, Bruce confirmed that that comment was specific to the Halifax County information you had shared. And then, um, Askia is curious about the observation you made about the outpatient and inpatient cases of COVID-19. We, we have done a lot of community testing that the state has contracted with Vardan Health to go out to the underserved communities, put up a tent and collect 
100, 200 people that one day and they get results the next day. Um, this is really based on state contract. And then the local health departments can also contract with Vidant Health to do this. Um, if any of the health departments want this for their community, if you give me a, contact me, I've got my email on that last page or so we can connect. Um, but the hospital, Vidant Health is willing to come to your community and do this also. But we, we, we are eager to do, we've got plenty of supplies, plenty of capacity to do laboratory testing. We, we could do up to 5,000 per day and we're currently hitting about a thousand. So you can see we've got plenty of capacity. I'm also, while we're talking about laboratory, I didn't mention it, but where antigen testing is gonna take us. Antigen testing is so much easier. It's point of care that it can be done in the nursing homes. I'm all in favor of more testing. I do think it's gonna have a detrimental effect on our reporting though. You're gonna have a lot of novice people who aren't used to the standard, our standard county reporting, standard state reporting, doing this testing. And it's probably gonna be a hodgepodge whether it comes back to the state reported or not. So it's gonna have, you're probably gonna see some counties go way up and you'll have some counties stay at their base level. And there's going to be some concern about that. And I really have to answer, I don't know. But I, I do think more testing is better. We just have to get used to that the reporting will be a little bit haphazard. Thank you, Bill. I had a question about, or a th I don't know if there's a question or a thought, when you noticed the Hispanic Latinx uh, discrepancies or that interesting uptick in July, we also in our communities had similar upticks and we were able to connect them to some of the farming timelines for, for people. You're shaking your head. Did you also look into that? A lot of this Hispanics, are working class individuals, um, they live, more likely live in high density homes. They travel for construction jobs, a lot of them in one vehicle. So if you take my numbers at face value and think that is true for the whole state, the conclusion you would draw is that Hispanics have reached their herd immunity and COVID is dropping off for Hispanic. I don't believe that that information. Um, COVID, they have the seroprevalence and nobody knows what the seroprevalence for COVID threshold is. You know, is it gonna be 40%, 50%, 80%? 95%, at what point do we hit zero prevalence that the virus burns itself out? And then also thinking about the Hispanic, whites and blacks, do we have three separate herds? And does each, well, it, if one herd gets to their immunity threshold faster, um, that might be what the, the COVID numbers are showing with that slot. I'd like to see the state information by Hispanics, either month to month or week to week and see if it demonstrates the same thing. Like I said, at UNC Chapel Hill, they were not seeing that. Interesting, thanks. Do we have any other questions or comments? I'm still unsure, Bill, if people can talk. 
What is your best contact? Um, I love email. Bill, what is your w email? I can type it in. W E C L E V E at vidaphealth.com. Wonderful. No space in between the body and the health. Perfect. Bill, we had anywhere between 25 and, and 35 people throughout your session. Good numbers. Um, Housekia says, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate everybody sticking with me. The technology is awkward. It's scary. <laughs> to say the least. Uh, but I, I have to appreciate you, Jennifer, too, for working out this Google solution. Hey. I mean, we've just totally <laughs> gone off base and found a solution. So thank you so much, Jennifer. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for staying calm. <laughs> Douglas. Oh, while we're talking about it, our business meeting is coming up. Yes. And we need people interested in helping with this session, people who enjoy this work, Yes. helping with the, the business part of the session too. 315 today and I'll put my email in here as well if you did not receive the invitation it's all of the business meetings are a separate um, invitation and we're, we're going to utilize the Google platform again I'm happy to share it actually I could go ahead and share it with everyone now um I'm so curious, can people actually talk? No. Okay, interesting. <laughs> this Hopin platform is quite interesting. Here is our link to our business meeting this afternoon, and um, we've got an agenda schedule planned where we're going to connect with each other and uh, talk about all of the crazy things happening in the lab and epi and statistics world and, and then do some elections. We're in need of filling a few spots. Um, we're also going to remember our friend today as well. Make time for that. We don't have that option, or at least I don't. I can't speak for everyone. I, th I think they don't have the ability to um, talk, Bill. So. Uh, Feel free to stay. We still have about seven minutes of the session left if anybody has any questions or their own insight. I, I do wish they could talk, huh, Bill? <laughs> well, they can come to our business meeting. Perfect. You know, they can talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll make sure of that. Wonderful. Bill, you did an excellent job. Very, I'm so glad you focused completely on, on the now and how we potentially move forward. Uh, Bruce says, great information. Thank you. Bill is a great asset for the Vident communities. Absolutely. Thank you, Bruce. Your check's in the mail. Ah! <laughs> Laugh out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I do miss the, the laughter and the applause. I know, right? It's gone. I can do it for you. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Oh, you did an excellent job, Bill. Thank you. Ditto. Thanks, says Askia. <laughs> You have a few checks to send today, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, next year, we have to plan about wrapping this thing up. Because COVID will be over next year? <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> Absolutely. That is the question, right? Bruce types in about 15 question marks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to get out of this business. Yeah. There aren't many breaks, are there? No. Nah. So 
you were saying you were reporting on a daily basis. What helped that transition from having to send that email every day? Was that dashboard? Yeah, it was that dashboard. That dashboard was real time. And all the hospital administrators had access to that. So if they were curious what the COVID numbers were doing, they just logged onto that web-based dashboard. Gotcha. That's fantastic. I read uh, an uh, uh, or I listened to a podcast recently that was talking about some of the um, big aha moments for public health, and one was, and you you highlighted this: um, public health is purchasing fax machines during this pandemic. <laughs> they are purchasing fax machines because that's the only method for communication. Um, I don't know, yeah, what thoughts uh, yeah. do you have? That faxing is such an unreliable resource that we can fax through our computers but our just as soon as we hit the fax send fax it says done um there are a lot of fax machines that are busy or it doesn't hit on the other side and we don't know that so we're just sending it off in this space <laughs> with our fingers crossed hoping that it hits the health department that the health departments have this one fax machine it's just overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So we've got to find better technology for the next outbreak. Well, it exists, right? We, we EMRs exist. All of that exists. Um, public health definitely is, it's time for a massive update and input of funding to get data systems to communicate. I know at our local health department, we're still... We have, we call them our Band-Aid Excel sheets where kind of bandages between communication of positives and communication with NC Eds long-term. And, you know, that that's a daily haul of trying to cross-reference and keep up with it. We still have about 11 people in the room. I'm afraid to stop. <laughs> I'm, I think we're going to automatically get kicked out at 10.15, so I've got three more minutes. <laughs> Hope we get some folks to join us this afternoon and... Dana is presenting on her leadership project today, Bill, which is exciting. <laughs> yes. 10.35, she said. Well, she needs to get going. I know. <laughs> she needs to make sure her technology is working. I know. <laughs> Do you hear us, Dana? <laughs> um, Kim did text back Bill, and she, she was thinking it is a two to log in um, snafu potentially. Um, if there was one login for your registration and then another login for part uh, as a speaker, she's wondering if that's what the snafu was. I think that's highly likely. Awesome. I did want to, to be a participant. I, I I enjoy this organization and wanted to help fund it. Agreed. And that you know this virtual conference is such a scary thing that I wanted to help participate. Absolutely. All right, it's ten fourteen. So just in case we get kicked out, Bill, I'll see you this afternoon. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you all. All right, Bill, I'm going to...